Oh, hey, uh, oops, we're we're on. Hey, everybody, Dan Schinder here on, and I hear some, what is that? There we go. Dan Schinder here on Yes Shift with... Steven Schinder. And our very special guest, we are honored to finally, finally have Tom Brislin on, who, of course, uh, is with Kansas and was on the Yes Symphonic Tour, and Steve's got the whole list of basically Tom's whole career we'll go through that but tom welcome and thank you oh thanks a lot thanks for having me on yeah absolutely uh steve i'm gonna let you kick it off where do you want to start right so you've had like such an extensive resume in 2009 you got to be part of renaissance's 40th anniversary tour with yes like we mentioned the symphonic tour and you even got to take part in some of the 50th anniversary stuff at Yes Fan Fest nearly five years ago. Now you're touring with Kansas, uh, like celebrating 50 years. So what's, how does it feel witnessing and taking part in all these anniversary celebrations of these really big prog bands? <laughs> well, it's pretty cool. I didn't expect it to be that way, but here I am. <laughs> Especially <laughs> growing up listening to them, right? And emulating them? Yeah, I mean, I, I, my musical background is I was raised on this 70s rock, thanks to my uh, older sisters and my brother. And I discovered music for myself in the 80s uh, on the radio, but I had that, that bedrock of, of Prague and, and just 70s music all around Zeppelin, Yes, Foreigner, all the, all the classics. And how did you start? Did you start on piano and keyboards? Did you start on another instrument? And were you formally trained from the beginning? What? How did your musical journey start as a musician? Piano was my first love. And there is photographic evidence of me banging on a piano when I'm two or three years old. And apparently I was writing songs before I really knew how to play. I was coming up with song titles and just singing whatever. And I used to draw album covers and Nice. things like that and then i my sisters started teaching me piano when i was about maybe six or seven and then i went from there into lessons uh with a teacher in my town and stayed with her all the way through high school oh wow. and, I went to, and i went to college for it but i always was doing piano in the lessons but also learning songs by ear on the side and trying to form bands since i was about 10. And uh, just, I, I never stopped. <laughs> it That's just great. kept going. And I, I just always was into it and always was serious about it. That's great. Uh, you, had, you had that vision of your future from a young age. Something like it. I don't know. It just was, I, I'm fortunate to have had this sort of clear sense of purpose. I can't explain it, yeah. but I was driven and it's been one continuous line to now. From them. That's great. We'll circle back to uh, your relationship with Yes, but let's talk about Kansas before we show a quick, really cool short clip. Do you have a favorite Kansas album and do you have a favorite part of the set list that you always just really get excited about? I'm sure you're excited about all of it, but is there that one special song and one special album that are your favorites? Well, in terms of my musical history and background, I have to say that when I finally got a CD player, when I was about, I don't know, 15 years old, and it was like, oh, now I have to build a CD collection. And what do a lot of people do at, in 1989 or 1990? And it was join Columbia House and get the 12 CDs for a penny. Right. And one of them was the best of Kansas. So it was one of the first CDs I heard in all of its clean digital glory. <laughs> right. <That's laughs> and it was funny because I heard songs that were playing on the AM radio in my folks' car when I was really a little, like Dust in the Wind or Carry On My Wayward Son, yeah. and songs that were played on the FM radio when I was discovering the radio for myself, like Fight Fire with Fire. And then there was this link to the progressive music scene that I wasn't aware of with Song for America. And that's really one of my favorite songs to play with the band. And it's just meant so much to me. And I think it really encapsulates a lot of what Kansas is about. Oh, that's great. Um, by coincidence, that's what we have a short clip of to show. <laughs> so dig this, everybody. This is really great uh, point of view 
of where Tom's playing uh, on camera, the way it was shot. Check this out, folks. 25 seconds of Tom Brislin and his backup band, Kansas. <laughs> That's so cool. Tom, that leads me to this question. When when you're emulating such classics like that, close to the edge, things like that, what's your method? Do you do it purely by ear or do you chart it out or do you go get whatever charts are available? What's your method? The first two of the three you mentioned because okay. I have no choice but to learn all this stuff by ear because there are no official scores. Right. There's been sheet music adaptations over the years, but yeah. in terms of the exact parts as played on the album, that's on me. Yeah. And so because of the volume of material, I do chart things out. Sometimes I'll make detailed transcriptions and sometimes I'll just make secret coded messages that only I can understand. <laughs> right. <laughs> Short cuts and shorthand and, and things like that. But uh but yeah, I mean I it all started for me with Meatloaf when I, I was tapped to be his pianist in 1998. And they sent me a CD live around the world and they said, play this. And the songs were in some different keys than the original studio recordings. Arrangements were a little different. So that was the the Bible for what I was going to do. And at that time, it was just you're playing the CD and you play a little segment of it and pause. And then I right, try to figure it out and, and I'll write out notation by hand and then play, pause, play, pause, and just rewind and just keep trying to figure it out over and over again. And similarly with Yes, it was a similar thing, only mm -hmm. I was so versed in the studio recordings with Yes that and that I was I was going by that. Yeah. And but similar process. I just had to kind of quick grab these things off the CD and try to adapt it. But again, Yes Music was in, burned in my soul <laughs> for yeah. so many years that it, it I had a little bit of an advantage going in. Uh, Kansas was <clears throat> same thing. Here's what we do live and here are the studio recordings. And only now in 2018, when I was learning the Kansas music, we've had some better tools for learning music now with right. the ability to slow down audio without changing the pitch, for yeah. instance. And it made things a little bit uh, more of a smooth workflow, still challenging, still, still you got to hear it. And, and sort of peer through the entire mix and find what exactly is the keyboard doing here. Mm -hmm. And then once I have all the notes together, then it's the sound programming, which I'm also responsible for. Right. So Thanks there's, for there's sharing that. layers yeah. to it. Yeah, layers yeah. to the job. Yeah, I, I remember a few years ago, um, you were sort of giving a little peek of what it's like to sort of go through the sticks material. I think that was when you were playing with uh, Dennis Day Young in the lead up to that. So that was like really neat to see. Um, yeah, and that was kind of an emergency fill in. So not a lot of time and here, <laughs> quick grab this stuff. And, you know, I had a couple more materials to work with, you know, thanks to John Basucci, who I was filling in for on keys. Yeah. But that was, I was just sort of stepping into that briefly and just grab a couple shows and then it was done. And, yeah. and rewinding back to the late, great Meatloaf, let's give him a shout out. Tell us something you learned from working with him that really stuck with you that has transcended through your playing and your career as a musician forward, whether it was musically, business, on stage, recording. Meatloaf taught me what it meant to play on big stages. Mm. And for large audiences, because especially in Europe and the UK, we were playing Wembley Arena and uh, arenas in Europe all over the place. So it was I was playing locally with my band yeah. and with a few other groups over the years. But this was a new situation, a new environment, a new mode of thinking. Yeah. And Meatloaf was such a performer. He considered himself an actor, yeah. an athlete more than a musician. And so it was all about 
emotional effect and bringing the entire audience into your world. So, and that's something that's stuck with me for forever. That's awesome. The only other person I've ever seen do that on that scale, it's Meatloaf and Freddie Mercury. They both were able to get on that Wembley size arena stage and bring everybody in, just like you said, just amazing. That That's a, a skill that you can't learn, really, you know, just as a front person, you know. Something special about it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we'll circle back to yes, but first of all, I'll read a few comments real quick. Marcel Chris Doob says, seems that learning by feel really helps, although reading might be the key to figuring out the nuances on the score. And <clears throat> I see Catherine Farrell Kelly says, you kill it on the spiders, see you in October. And Robert Gaeta says, spider this tour again. Um, so yeah, thanks for the comments, people tuning in. Um, but going back to the Yes gig, when you got that uh, role on the Symphonic Tour, like when you came in, was the set list already set in stone or were there a couple songs still being considered that never made the cut for the Symphonic Tour? There were a couple tweaks along the way. When we played North America, which was the first half of the Symphonic Tour, we were not playing Owner of a Lonely Heart in the set. Right. We were playing Wondrous Stories for some of it. Oh. And we had not yet put the song magnification in at first. So over time, Wondrous Stories eventually went out yeah. and magnification came in. And for Europe, it was really for the DVD that the promoters really wanted us to play Owner of a Lonely yeah. Heart. And we had been doing just fine without it on the symphonic tour, but it's the biggest hit song the band's had. So of course the the powers that be that were investing into this DVD wanted to make sure that got on there. And once we played that in Amsterdam for the DVD, it, it stuck around for the rest of the tour. Interesting. Yeah, I saw you at the Hollywood Bowl, um, which was great. It was just such a great experience. And I have to say for John Anderson, this is not, that was not the first or last time I saw this happen when, I don't know if you remember, I, with so many shows, I don't know if you remember this, but right after the long, beautiful, musical, instrumental intro to Gates of Delirium, when everything finally calmed down, he completely forgot the first line, looked around, and Chris slid over and leaned over in his ear, and then John just started singing, didn't count anything, and then the, the conductor did this, and the orchestra got back into place, it was great, and they, it just all continued on beautifully. Um, that that's a great venue to see a show and I'm sure to perform at as well. What was the sound like dealing with in your capacity with the orchestra on stages like that? Was it a really nice in-ear mix? Did you also have monitor wedges? I only had in-ear monitors. Okay. Uh, I think Alan White used some wedges as well. Mm -hmm. Chris Squire had some speakers because they, they still liked that link to the to the old ways of doing things, yeah. but there yeah. was also in-ear monitoring so we could have more precision. There was plexiglass everywhere separating the orchestra from the band, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a lot to handle. And since I was touring with Meatloaf and was using in-ear monitors, I, I became selective with what I absolutely needed to hear to get the gig mm. done. It may that not be sense. the most interactive thing, but especially when we're playing music that's mostly the same on any given night, I was like, well, I need to hear the, you know, this, this, and this, and get to, to get through it. Because if you start trying to be a super precious, I want to hear every little nuance and nook and cranny, <laughs> it can get really crowded and you might miss something that you need. That's awesome. Thanks. You know, Steve, one of Steve's favorite all time musical works is the Anderson Stoltz invention of knowledge. What was it like getting involved with that? How did that transpire? And what was the recording process like? I used to front a band called Spiraling mm -hmm. and yeah. we were mostly a you know, modern rock band, a synth rock band, somewhere between the Cars and the Foo Fighters and XTC and just power pop, but there was some progressive influences. And this had, this was a band I started when I was 19 years old. And once I was 
tapped for yes, and the yes audience started becoming aware of what I what I was doing. Spiraling would get invited to play at progressive shows and festivals, and we played in Cal Prague at Cal Prague in 2005 alongside the Flower Kings, oh, and that's how I met Roy Nestalt and Jonas Reingold, and we struck up a kinship then and just kept in touch for years. In fact, I actually did meet him when he was touring with Transatlantic because they all came to see Yes in Frankfurt on the symphonic tour. So I met all the Transatlantic guys just a few years before having this context and actually getting to really chat with them. And it was something so when uh, I think Reina had struck up a musical relationship with John Anderson on one of the cruises mm. and they decided to make an album together and Reina said, well, Tom was involved with Yes. And, and John was also trying to do something with me for many years. <laughs> so this was a cool opportunity. And this was no remote recording affair. I went oh, to Sweden and, and, and got on many planes and trains and automobiles <laughs> and got to this <laughs> studio in the middle of nowhere uh, in a beautiful place in Sweden. And there were a lot of notes. <laughs> <laughs> to play. But that was really, that was Ruina and, and John's creation. So I was really just playing what they, they wanted um, to hear on that. But that, did, that was really did, fun. And did, John I want to really just fun. chime in. Did you have any licensing or how much licensing did you or did you not have on the sounds that, that were used? A little bit of discussion. Mm -hmm. But most of what Ruina was thinking was kind of what I was thinking in terms of sounds anyway. The, the main food groups of prog rock. Yeah. Classic sounds, Mellotrons, Hammond's organ, Moke. You know, it's like yeah. let's let's not try to reinvent the wheel. Rip. We're gonna we're gonna do this sort of classic thing. And John was really into that. That's awesome. Well, speaking of spiraling and John Anderson and lots of notes, we're gonna play a little bit of a clip. I'm gonna scoot through it of spiraling playing sound chaser. This is an amazing performance. One of my favorite things to play personally on drums and what Alan White cited as the most adventurous song Yes ever did from a rhythm section standpoint. Uh, so check this out, folks. Makes me want to just get up, let you guys finish this, and go down and play in my studio. <laughs> just great. What yeah, a, that sound chaser clip always brings a smile to my face. Yeah, I think we. When did we first pull that out, Steve? I think Tom for uh, your birthday episode the first time he, around. I think. Yeah, back in uh, late twenty twenty one. I think. Yeah. 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 Uh, awesome stuff. Yeah. So. Um, like you said, yes, got you some attention. And it's sort of, um, to use a pun, it sort of spiraled from there. You know, you got involved with all these other bands. Um, and one of them was uh, Sin, which originally uh, featured Peter Banks and Chris Squire. Chris rejoined the reformed version for a bit in the 2000s before leaving again. But you were involved for... A bit. Can you tell us a bit about your time uh, playing Sin? Yes. I was uh, on board with uh, another reinvention of the Sin after Chris Squire had rejoined for Sin Destructible, which I thought was a beautiful album. Mm -hmm. And I was part of the group for an album called Big Sky. It did The whole op, uh, enterprise didn't last very long. But I, I really enjoyed that record. It's a really cool, groovy Americana, almost funny because it's a British band. Yeah. But it, it was really 
uh, there was real natural flavor to it. I was playing a Wurlitzer electric piano, an acoustic upright piano. It was very earthy and real fun. And I thought the best parts of it were the were the chill aspects mm. of, of that band. How neat. And we had Annie As- Haslin on a few months ago, um, and she praised you. And, of course, to be able to dig into the roots of Renaissance and everything, and you also played, I mean, another great band, you played with how did that transpire and what was that experience like it's funny with renaissance that was right as the sin was wrapping up our record and sort of wrapping up our existence so to speak in that in that regard and annie had gotten my name from i think like three different directions i think she asked jordan rudis about keyboard players and he said talk to Tom Brislin and, and she talked to Patrick Mraz and he said, talk to Tom. <laughs> she was like, <laughs> funny. and so she said, your name kept coming up. So, uh, but it was, my job with that band was to recreate the orchestra parts. Mm. Rafe Tessar was playing the, the role of the pianist that, uh, that John Tout had done in, in the classic lineup of, right. um, of Renaissance in the seventies. So, it was I, I was looking at scores and adapting strings and woodwinds and brass for for Renaissance, and you know I got to solo a little bit here and there, but it was mostly a a, a different kind of role than I'm used to. Interesting, Steve. I think there's some more comments. Uh, yeah. Let me just uh, look over here. For just a moment. Okay. Um, we do have like some comments that people. Uh, left for us as we were advertising this. So I'll just look at that. Okay. Um, So Tony Jefferson said, Tom's awesome. I saw him with Yes twice in 2001 and also recently with Kansas. And then Pete Wilder said, Tom Brislin did such an amazing job with Yes. Should have been a full-time member, but and then just ends there. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Uh, Brian Fuller says Tom should be a household name. I saw him with Yes Symphonic. Wait, very high priest. it's not. I'm <laughs> in my house and I know your name. Yeah, same here. <laughs> <laughs> Those are some great, um, some great praise. And uh, Bunker S and M says, please remind him and thank him for taking such good care with the keyboard parts during the Yes Symphonic tour. He respected not only every note, but also sounded like the recordings. All other Yes keyboardists have taken their licenses in terms of sound over the years, including Rick. So once again, thank you, Tom. And if it's possible, please ask him about his thoughts. No, we can't do that. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Ask him about his thoughts and feelings about Topographic Oceans. Where does that album sit for you? I like Topographic Oceans. I especially like it on vinyl. And I'm not like a vinyl hipster. I mean, I grew up (laughs) with it. And I, I in really enjoy certain albums in the vinyl experience, and that's one of them. It just it just sort of like just oozes out of the speakers in a in a really cool, warm way for me. Yeah. And uh, you know, I think that playing Ritual every night with on the S Symphonic Tour was really quite an adventure, especially since I got in on the percussion bash. Yeah. And that was, you know, and it was even longer than than the album side. So it, it was it was really fun to to play that music. And I, as far as the sounds go, you know, his comment about taking care of the sounds. I, I'm, I geek out on that stuff. I love the old sounds. And one of the challenges is really getting those sounds with whatever equipment is available in those certain eras. It's a right. lot. It would be a lot easier to do now. Yeah, because the the there are so many vintage sound libraries and yeah. synthesizers out there. Whereas at in two thousand one, I when I got the gig with Yes, one of the first things I did was I went on eBay and I bought a Mini Moog. <laughs> I said I am now a keyboardist for Yes. Buy it now. Yeah. And then, but much to my dismay, they did not want me to bring a Mini Moog. Oh, really? hilarious. Because I think they remembered all the headaches and the tuning issues and the repair and the yeah. fact that you can't recall different sound settings. You have to do it all live yeah. in, in the moment. And so they were like, we, and John really liked modern things. I mean, if you think about it, in the era yeah. of topographic and, and fragile, those were the modern new instruments. Right. 
So the way I, I did end run around it all was I, I got this synthesizer called the Andromeda, which what had the analog heart of an old synth, but it was in a new unit. Yeah. Then it was, oh, is this brand new? This is new stuff I got right here. But that's one of the things I was able to get some of those vintagey tones with was that keyboard. And, you know, just even emulating a Hammond organ is is not as easy as as you think to get to get right. a real juicy sound yeah. out of it. Dealing so with we, draw bars, like what the hell? Right. Yeah, but I had <laughs> I had a at the time on the Symphonic, it was the Korg CX3, the one they had just come out with, but and using this system called a motion sound, which was like a little mini part of a, a Leslie speaker, rotating speaker, mm -hmm. which is what gives the Hammond organ its mojo. Yeah. And that was the best I could do because I didn't have the kind of uh, leverage to go in there and be like, I want a Hammond B3, a drum <laughs> piano. Right. And, yeah, but I had to just work with four keyboards, especially since I had a smaller footprint than a Yes keyboardist usually gets on the stage plot. Right. We had a little thing called an orchestra. Yes. Yeah. You had 70 people two. behind it taking up all that space. So it's funny, in some contexts, four keyboards is a lot. Yeah. It's like, oh man, well, you got all these keyboards, but in in yes, that's like a quarter of the. <laughs> Abs absolutely, you know. So back, I, I'd make it work. Yeah, back back th right there. I have a cabinet with all my old vinyl, and I have my vinyl of Topographic Oceans from when it came out. It's my favorite gatefold. It does sound great on vinyl, and I'm teaching a 16 year old drum student of mine right now. The revealing science of God. It's just it, that's my stuck on an island, coincidentally, album. <laughs> like if I had one album to listen to, that's it. That's the album for me. Yeah, just love it. It's beautiful, awesome. Steve. Yeah, we also uh, got Gina Hall McElroy. He said uh, regarding the Song for America clip, Tom is a badass. So fun to watch. And John McWiggin says... Wait, she's talking about music, right? Yeah. Okay. John McWiggin says, awesome musician. Um, but going back to our questions, um, can you tell us about any new music you might be working on? I am working on new music for Kansas. Ooh, oh, nice. We Great. Will, we will have another album one of these days. We have this 50th anniversary tour that's on our plate right now, getting the music ready for that. There's some songs I haven't played with the group yet. And in in between all of that learning and studying and practicing, I'm, I'm writing music because when we did the absence of presence, I really jumped into that process and ended up writing a lot of the lyrics on the album, and some of the music. So with that trust, I'm running with it. <laughs> that's great. I think it's some of the band's proggiest stuff in quite a while, actually. So I'm really curious to hear what's coming next. If it'll be more the same, more the same elaborated or a complete pivot. And you don't have to spoil it if it's a secret. Well, there's no secret, but I will say okay. this. Um, we don't have to worry about trying to get a radio hit. Right. Oh. We just we just do whatever we want to do. That's great. <laughs> and have fun with it. And But the thing about Kansas is that there are hooks and there's – memorable melodies and some pop aspects of it that's part of the dna of that band so yeah. we're not going to go off the deep end but it's all flavors are available that's great. yeah absence of presence is very top notch it's there there's such a gap uh for me of kansas albums i still need to get to i've listened to the first few and i've listened to absence of presence but Absence of Presence does such a great job of showing where Kansas is now and just bring the sound forward. And I, I really enjoyed your contributions on that. You know, the keys, the lyrics, and even some singing. It's a really great album. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Any uh, further activities from the Sea Within planned? Never say never. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but it, 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 the Sea Within was uh, something that ended up being short lived for a few reasons. I, I, got, I started playing with Kansas and Jonas got on the Steve Hackett tour, and every, you know, a lot of things happened that we didn't expect but had to run with. 
But if it weren't for The Sea Within, I might not be in Kansas because it was our show with The Sea Within in Germany at the Night of the Prague Festival that got our label basically interested in, in telling Kansas to get me because oh, we're also on that label. <laughs> so, that, so there was, I didn't realize that I was in fact doing a, like almost like an audition for Kansas. Right. It, Showcase. You know. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of music with the sea within that, that's really special to me. And I had some contributions on that album and I, I like all the musicians that, that were part of it. That's great. Is there anyone besides me that you just dream to work with that you haven't worked with yet? Besides me. I, besides you, I, I, you know, I got my hands full. People ask me, like, who are you going to play with next? I'm like, I want to stay here. Right. <laughs> if time wasn't such a tight commodity, is there someone that you'd love to just take a year, write with, record with, and tour with that you haven't yet? I mean, I someone who I'd love to to do some music with would be Colin Hay, mm. who's probably my favorite singer. Really? Nice. Yeah, I've always loved his voice. Oh, that's great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like this talk about time. I mean, we were kind of talking about it earlier, but whenever I look at the touring schedule for Kansas, it's like there's always something happening with very little gaps in between, and it all looks continuous. Um, like you were saying that you guys are doing the Kansas classics from – March through mid to late May, and then the 50th tour starts in June. Like, how do you guys do it? How do you guys keep up with all this uh, touring? And I'm scheduling? sure staying healthy is part of it, right? Yeah, that's a big part of it. <laughs> yeah. And doing our homework, really. I, a lot of that's on me because I, I'm the one that hasn't played some of this music before, yeah. whereas the other guys have. <laughs> yeah. We, we have the luxury of having a little bit of a backstage rehearsal space before mm. every show. Oh. So we can warm up and, and work on things. It's just with, you know, I'll have one keyboard, there'll be a drum pad, yeah. little practice amps, That's a little cool. campfire style, but it gets us in the mode. But to get on stage and work out the full production of things, that that's a, those opportunities are hard to come by. So we yeah. have to make the most of it. That's great. Are there any bands or artists that are more contemporary whether established or up and coming uh that you like that you'd like to kind of turn people on to i like the funky stuff snarky puppy mm -hmm. fearless flyers the gro oh, yeah. stuff yeah I, I just i mean just a lot of great instrumentalists and players in the jazz scene things like that that's the stuff that that seems to be uh, piquing my interest a lot cool very cool. Thanks. Yeah. And I see uh, a couple more comments. Uh, English Curse says, I really love this program. Wow, thanks. And RY Scraper Justice says, hey, from the state of Kansas. Oh, that's like the band's name. <laughs> um, so it, if you went back in time and told your younger self as you started playing, which bands and musicians you'd work with in the future. How do you think your younger self would react to like all this information of like everything you've done so far? It would certainly be a shock because it was, it wasn't something that seemed like it was even an option. You just saw those bands and they were those guys. And, <laughs> right. And I was going to be part of a new band and maybe be influenced by those groups. I think the first time I got like just like sort of a a glimmer of the possibility was I think it might have been Rick Wakeman in an interview said something about how he'd like to see the music of Yes go on and on and on after oh, they're yeah. gone. Like yeah, like that's symphony. in the Yes Years documentary. Yes Years, yeah, and and it was it was like a symphony orchestra. Yeah, and exactly. and I you know for maybe a split second said oh maybe I could be a part of Yes one day. Right. And, but it, it was very unexpected. It's funny because in 2000, while I was with Meatloaf's band, I went to see the Masterworks tour because Yes and Meatloaf had the same management at the time. Mm -hmm. So through my connections, I got to go to the Yes show and, and it was Kansas and Yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. So the last yeah. thing I thought at the time was that I would be <laughs> in both of these groups yeah. <laughs> one day. Yeah, they should have called it the Kansas Tour or 
<laughs> like you can do that with a couple of band names like yes and genesis could be genesis yes but i digress <laughs> so you digress yes you digress yeah <laughs> tom if if you were to show up for a jam and were asked to bring one keyboard with you what would that keyboard be not knowing what kind of music was going to be played just what what's the most utilitarian versatile workhorse in your mind that you it's one that i don't currently own oh <laughs> <laughs> but i would say the nord stage three would be something oh. i would bring because it's got all the the main essentials covered very well mind you and also it, it doesn't weigh a ton so i could actually walk into the jam session with it under my arm oh that's cool noted okay um what being that yes shift of course is based around the yes verse if you will can you share one or two fun anecdotes from when you were on tour with them that i can reveal publicly yeah no just <laughs> no. here on yes shift well i re i re do remember it was there was one show we were in england playing and from night to night the the show was largely the same and the 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 moves that everyone was doing or lack thereof were, were kind of the same. But on this one particular night, it was strange because Chris Squire started coming toward me in the middle of the song, which he normally didn't do. He would do that in Starship Trooper and we'd have a little banter, a musical uh, conversation, if you will, mm -hmm. in the middle of that. But uh, And also in, um, in Ritual, we would do that too. But... This was something different. He was just coming my way, playing the song. I was like, uh oh, what did I do? What did I do wrong? And and he's like leaning toward me to tell me something. I pull my earphone out and I'm not gonna imitate his voice, but but he he said, This was the show that Rick was eating a curry on stage. <laughs> and, and what what's funny is that A, he assumed I would know the reference. Right. <laughs> And B, I knew the reference. <laughs> so yes, for those listening who don't know, yeah, like Rick Wakeman famously told his stagehand to get some curry, and and they brought it out to him on stage, which I don't think he expected them to do. But yeah, it, yeah, I think so, in the in Chris Welch's book, Close to the Edge: A Story of Yes, the way it was recounted was that. Rick told a stagehand like during a song after this, we're going to get some curry. And the stagehand thought he was saying he wants curry like right now. And so <laughs> the stagehand went, got the curry and brought it to him. And Rick was like distracted by it. It's like, well, might as well eat it now type of thing. Yeah, so I'm laughing. I'm still trying to play yes music with two hands on keyboards, trying not to lose it. And that's, and that's the funniest postscript to that story is that as Chris is walking back to his station, John looked at him and was like, like what was up? that? You know, and I saw Chris <laughs> lean over to tell him something and probably the same thing. And John started losing it and he started laughing and we're all trying to just keep doing the music. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's funny. Tom, that is funny story. Hilarious. Tell us just a, a personal, a somewhat personal, not, not too personal. What do you like to do when you're not, and I know there's slivers of time only, but what do you like to do when you're not playing music, when you're not writing, recording, touring, what keeps you off the news outside of that? <laughs> it's funny, you know, someone recently in an interview asked me about my hobbies and I, it took me a minute. I was like, man, am I, am I boring? <laughs> no, but it's like, busy. Well, yeah, you, you, know, you, you I, only play a lot of music. Well, <laughs> there was an interview with Emerson Lake and Palmer some TV show they appeared on. It has been like 1971 or something. And they were asking them what their hobbies were. And Keith Emerson said, I don't have time for a hobby. <laughs> yeah. Devoted my whole life to music. And I was thinking, now I get it. Yeah. Because in order to do this, it's full commitment. So when I'm not doing it, I just uh, like to spend time with family and friends and loved ones and, and just try. It's about the people because yeah. I, I so rarely get to, to see them. And, uh, so that that's really what it comes down to. But, you know, I like checking movies and w whatever. But, uh, you know, I used to draw a lot, but that's ancient history. Yeah. Um, Do you have a favorite all, all movie things, genre? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> science fiction or oddball comedies, you know, okay. just anything unusual. Uh, but, you know, the, the things that I used to be decent at 
not musically, like we're, we're like basketball and volleyball, two things that pose a direct risk to your hands. Yeah. So I'm like, well, this is my livelihood. So I, I think I'm going to leave basketball and volleyball. Yeah, just <laughs> sit out. Forever. I totally get that. Absolutely. So, yeah. Uh, but still like to watch. Well, that's awesome. Tom, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. And you're welcome to come on anytime and promote anything that you have going on, whether it's solo or with one of your many backup bands that you record <laughs> and tour with. And uh, hang on the line uh, after we disconnect from the audience. And folks, thank you so much for following us, Stephen and myself here on Yes Shift. And for those of you watching on the Drum Talk TV simulcast, thank you as well. We'll be back with more live Drum Talk TV stuff very soon. And everybody stay safe, fun, and happy, and try to be nice to each other, okay? There you go. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Bye.